This is the Karma of Vocation by Rudolf Steiner. This is the 10th lecture given in November the 27th, 1916. When we seek the answer to the question to which we referred in the last lecture as to how human beings may establish a relationship with the Christ today, the objection is made by many that a number of human beings already have a relationship with him. I have spoken frequently about this objection and we know that it is invalid. On more careful consideration, it turns out to be a thoroughly egoistic objection that can be made only by a person who has the following view. I have a faith that makes me happy. Anything else is no concern of mine. But in general, humanity's relation to the Christ being is not satisfactory. That is easily recognisable from the events of our times and little needs to be added. The necessary answer to this objection can be given by everyone by saying that a basic element in the confession of Christ must be the truth that he died and rose for all men, for all men alike, and that when man turns against man for the sake of external possessions, it can never be done in his name. It is possible for a person to turn away from this general human destiny to apply himself solely in egoistic fashion to his own creed. Certainly, but then no attention is paid to the fact that the occurrence of the mystery of Golgotha is something that primarily concerns human society. We will now have to mention something that may draw our attention to what is essential in the path that leads to Christ, since it is obvious that each soul must find a way to him for himself with those means that are suitable for the present time. When we seek to understand in a more profound sense what the Christ being signifies for the earth, we must first acquaint ourselves with the truth of an essential element in the mystery of Golgotha, that is, it actually occurred only once at a definite period in space and time. When we fix this in our minds, we shall discover a contradiction of a view that is generally held, even by us. We should not simply seek to remove it by argumentation, since it is justifiable and must first be recognised if we desire to remove it for our own souls. You see, provided the mystery of Golgotha is an inner and genuine truth, it cannot represent anything but the meaning of the evolution of the earth. But, as we know, everything that occurs in time and space belongs to the realm of Maya, the great illusion. That is, it does not belong to the real and eternal, the essential nature of things. Thus we face the highly significant contradiction that the mystery of Golgotha belongs to Maya, the great illusion, and we must place this contradiction before our souls in its full validity. Now, since this mystery of Golgotha occurred during the time of the earthly evolution of humanity, let us first consider this evolution. We know, of course, that what we have to deal with is that the human being has come over from earlier worlds, and that at a definite point of time, as we have set forth in my book, An Outline of Occult Science, he was subjected to what may be called a luciferic temptation, a seduction. We have often considered this luciferic seduction in the sense in which spiritual scientific investigation shows it, and we know it was expressed in a magnificent image at the beginning of the Old Testament, in the so-called Fall of Man, the image of Lucifer as a serpent in paradise is one of the mightiest representations of religious documents. When we survey the time through which humanity passed from the Luciferic temptation to the mystery of Golgotha, we find it to be a time in which human beings gradually descended from a primeval, atavistic, clairvoyant revelation that was brought over from earlier planetary stages in which the spiritual worlds had a real existence before their souls. During the centuries preceding the mystery of Golgotha, therefore, they were no longer able to look up to the spiritual world as they had done before, but they now possessed only echoes of the ancient knowledge of the spiritual world. Taking now a relatively short period of earthly time, since we cannot go all the way back to the Luciferic temptation, let us review the successive descending stages of human evolution down to the mystery of Golgotha. If we go back far enough, we discover that what men possessed at an earlier time as an atavistic wisdom, as a real perception of the spiritual world, 
now echoed in the world conceptions of the religions as reverence for a more or less significant but highly regarded ancestor. That is to say, in various regions of the earth we find religious cults that we may call ancestral cults. Such cults in which men took up with reverence to an ancestor still survive among those who have remained at a more or less early stage of evolution. What is the reason for this adoration? What is the reality behind this looking up to an ancestor in ancient times? In those most ancient times to which history can still look back, in that hoary antiquity, we have a certain epoch in which ancestral cults are customary. Such ancestral cults were not based on fact, as is supposed by superficial contemporary science, but those belonging to them imagined they had to look up to a certain ancestor. But the nature of the most ancient ancestral cults was such that men had a direct vision of their ancestors at a certain time in their lives. At these times, in a state of consciousness between waking and sleeping, such as was universal in the earlier stages of human evolution, a person who looked up to an ancestral god really attained a condition of union with what he reverenced as his ancestor. The ancestor appeared to him not merely merely in a dream, but in a dream-like image that signified something real to him, and those individuals to whom the same ancestor appeared belonged together in a single ancestral cult. What these individuals beheld in spirit was, to be sure, a human form elevated to a lofty level, but something entirely different was concealed behind it. If we wish to know what was really concealed behind this spirit form, we must realise that the ancestor had once died and had left the earth as a highly regarded personality who had wrought much good for a human community. He had passed through the portal of death, and when these individuals looked up to him, he was on the way between death and a new birth. As these human beings looked up to him, what was it they saw of him? We know, of course, that when a human being passes through the portal of death, he remains for a short time in his etheric body before it is cast off. But the casting off of this body signifies that it passes over into the spiritual worlds, into the etheric world. The human being continues to develop in his ego and his astral body. The etheric body passes over into the etheric world. Since this man had performed something lasting on earth, the memory of his etheric body continued for a long time. It is this etheric body of the ancestor that was beheld in the ancient atavistic dreamlike clairvoyance and people revered what was revealed to them through it. But during the period between death and a new birth, this etheric body comes into contact with the spirits of the higher hierarchies, most particularly with those belonging to the hierarchy of the archai, the spirits of time. Since this particular ancestor was a significant personality for human evolution, he thus established a union with the time spirit who was bringing human evolution one step forward. What made itself known through this ghost, as we may call it, of the ancestor was, in reality, one of the time spirits, so worship within the most ancient religions was really directed to the time spirit. Wherever we go back into those times that we look upon as the hoary antiquity of history, we find that human beings worship the etheric bodies of their forefathers to cause the time spirits to reveal themselves. That is to say, as we go back to the ancestral cults, what we find is the worship of the time spirits, the archai. Men then descended further and began to worship those gods who are known to us from the various mythologies and whom we call archangels. Even Zeus in Greek mythology possessed arch archangelic manifestations. In the most ancient times, people looked up to the time spirits. Later, they looked up to those spirits who are not time spirits but are of equal value with the spirits who control the guidance of different peoples, the archangels. Thus we may say that polytheism, when human beings worshipped archangels, follows after ancestral worship. Then human beings descend still further to the period in which the ego is gradually to be born in the individual. We now find that the most advanced nations pass over to monotheism at a relatively early period, the Egyptians, for example, even in the second millennium before Christ, the people of the Near East later. That is, they begin to worship angels, 
every person his or her own angel, rather than an archangel. They descend from the higher polytheism to the lower monotheism. After what has previously been presented to you, you will not consider what I am about to say as something strange. You will see that people must cure themselves of the pride that permeates the entire field of religious studies, which deems itself justified to consider monotheism as a religion superior to polytheism. By no means is it so, but the relationship of the two is just as has been described. Why then could the ancient people still worship archi, archangels and angels? They could do so because they still preserved a remnant or echo of the atavistic clairvoyant capacity. For this reason they were able to lift themselves up to what is superhuman. They could, in a certain sense, rise above the human and elevate themselves to the superhuman. In the ancient mysteries, this process of elevating oneself to the superhuman was especially cultivated. Human beings were developed so that they could unfold within themselves what extended beyond the human, whereby the human soul lifted itself into the realm of spirituality. But then came the time when the human ego, as it lives here between birth and death, was born for human beings. This was the period coinciding with the occurrence of the mystery of Golgotha. If the mystery of Golgotha had not occurred, people would have degenerated. They would have descended from worshipping angels to worshipping the next subordinate hierarchy, man himself. When we recall how the Roman Caesars had themselves worshipped as gods, how they really were gods to the people, we shall know that at the time of the mystery of Golgotha, human beings had degenerated so far that they now no longer pray to archi, archangels or angels, but to man. In order to save man from praying to earthly human beings, it was necessary for the divine man to appear. The entrance of the divine man into history signified an important new way to relate oneself to religious life. Where had the worship of angels, archangels, archi, and even that of man in the form of the Roman Caesars been found? in man himself. No one worshipped the Caesars through the Caesars, but through the worshipper himself. Obviously this had arisen from man, it came from the human soul. It was necessary that the Christ should appear as historic fact in the evolution of humanity. It was necessary that he should be seen like the phenomena of nature from without. He had to come into touch with human beings in an entirely different way from that of the gods of the ancient religions in an entirely different way. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This is an important principle in Christianity because it signifies that, whereas it is possible through mere individual mysticism to find angels, archangels, even archai, it is not possible by this individual mysticism to find the Christ. Those who wish to practice individual mysticism, as this is often described even among theosophists, generally reach only the individual angel. They simply internalize this angel more, even making him often somewhat more egoistic than other persons make their gods. The Christ is found in different ways, not through the mere development of one's inner being, but when we are most of all aware that the Christ belongs to the community of human beings, to the whole of human community. We now come to a most important differentiation which can be taken into the human mind. We must admit, only with great difficulty. It is imperative, however, that we force ourselves to its level. When we face another human being in life, it is in Maya that we, as human beings, face each other. Just as we have before us only the Maya of natural phenomena, so are we likewise confronted only with the Maya of the other human being. It is within Maya that this human being stands before our external senses and all that is connected with the external world of the senses. Then he stands before us as belonging to his family, his nation, his time. If we should su survey him completely, we should see behind him the angel, the archangel, the archai, but they all express themselves in what the person is. It is because the archangel and the archai stand behind the observer and the human being observed. The latter is in a sense a member of certain human groups. 
In other words, the observed person in this way stands within heredity and hereditary relationships. Only our shortness of vision, understandable because we are human, prevents us from consciously judging a human being before us according to these essential connections. Unconsciously, we always do this. Unconsciously, we face one another within this differentiation, which must inevitably be brought into humanity by these three hierarchies. But the Christ demands something more, something different. He demands in reality that when you face someone, you shall feel that what such a human being appears to you to be in the external world is not the entire and complete human being. When you face a human being, you should perceive his or her real being as coming not only from archai, archangels and angels, but from higher spirits no longer belonging to the earthly or even planetary evolution, because this begins with the archai, the higher heavenly spirits, as you know from an outline of occult science. You must see that with the human being something enters into Maya that is supra-mundane. To understand fully what I have just expressed, you must not allow it to remain a mere concept, but carry it over completely into your feelings. It is necessary to understand clearly that in every human being something supra-mundane in his nature comes to meet us, something not to be understood by earthly human means. Then everyone will experience that sensitive reverence in the presence of all that is human. Before the mystery of Golgotha, man had gradually lost this superhuman element and had descended all the way to being human. The superhuman element had been lost because, listen carefully, when a human being such as a Roman Caesar comes to be worshipped as a god, he loses his humanity and sinks to the level of the subhuman. He ceases to be a human being if he permits himself to be worshipped as something superhuman in social life. Man was threatened, therefore, with the loss of his humanity, and it was restored to him through the appearance of Christ on earth. Read the cycles of lectures from Jesus to Christ, in which I spoke on this question, telling you that something is really imparted to every individual human being through the fact that Christ was on earth. Thus, the coming of the Christ has brought it about that we recognise in every earthly human being, even if he is a sinner or a publican, the Christ who is behind him. The Christ sat down with sinners, so that we shall recognise in every earthly human being the truth of the statement, What thou dost to the least of my brethren, thou hast done unto me. As I have said, this concept must be transferred entirely into our feeling nature, only then shall we attain to its full truth. Then one also sees all concepts and ideas that separate men from one another fall away. And something belonging to all men in common spreads as an aura over the entire earth when we vow that we shall carry our search not merely to the archai, but upward to what stands above them whenever we are in the presence of a human being. If we look back again to the ancient mysteries, we find that in them, the human being endeavoured to transcend his own being in order to have his soul coalesce with the spiritual world. But through the occurrence of the Luciferic temptation, this is only partially possible. In this ascent, the possibility is lost to ascend still further. It is not possible to bear anything more up into the higher world. Why is this so? The answer to this question will come to us if we fix our attention on the profounder meaning of the Luciferic temptation. What does Lucifer truly purpose for humanity? We have often emphasised this. Humanity lives in Maya, something that is not the real world, but only a mirror of it. What, then, is Lucifer's intention? In this mirror, the human being can lift himself up to a few stages as far as to the archive, but he must then be taken over by Lucifer if he desires to rise still higher into the spiritual. In a certain sense, he must then take Lucifer as his guide. Lucifer, who constitutes the light that guides him further. If the Luciferic evolution had continued, if Christ had not entered into human evolution, the following would have come about after the time in which the mystery of Golgotha ought to have taken place. Human beings within the mysteries would have developed to such an extent that the archive would have been openly visible to them. 
then they would have entered into the Luciferic world. In that case, however, all that the higher gods such as the Exusii implanted into earthly evolution in the form of the human element would have remained on earth. Man would have spiritualized himself in an entirely ascetic way and would have entered into the spiritual Luciferic world in this ascetic spiritualization, leaving behind the corporal. Human souls would have found their salvation, but the earth would have remained purposeless. The bodies of human beings would never have been able to render the service to the souls that they really ought to render. To prevent this constitutes the significance of the mystery of Golgotha. We must now look back once more to the evolution before the mystery of Golgotha if we wish to understand this matter completely. From the very beginning of the evolution of the earth, it was Lucifer's intention to lead men away from the earth into his spiritual kingdom. He had no interest in the rest of earthly evolution, but wanted only to possess what the higher gods had initiated in connection with man. He wished to lead this away in the form of the soul from the earthly evolution after it remained for a time in the earthly form that comes from the exousiae, the spirits of form. In other words, he wished to lead the souls away and lead the earth to its fate. Why is it then that human beings did not follow this endeavour of Lucifer before the mystery of Golgotha to lead them into a luminous world? Why didn't they? You may understand the reasons from many suggestions I've given here, even in these very lectures. They did not follow Lucifer because something was introduced into the evolution of the earth by the higher gods that prevented them from becoming light enough to do so. As I have shown you, what is called the ape sphere was introduced into earthly evolution in ancient times. As one of its aspects, the ape sphere consists of man's acquiring such a preference for and attachment to his lower nature that Lucifer is not able to remove the higher nature from. Every time Lucifer endeavoured to spiritualise human beings, they were too strongly habituated to the flesh to follow him. If they had not been possessed by this cleaving to the flesh, to the physical nature, they would have followed Lucifer. This is one of the great mysteries of cosmic existence, that a divine element was actually implanted in human nature so that it might have, as it were, a greater heaviness than it would have possessed if this divine and necessary element had not been implanted in it. If it had not been implanted, human souls would have obeyed Lucifer. When we go back into ancient times, we find everywhere that the religions lay emphasis on the necessity of human beings reverencing what is earthly, what is an earthly connection living in flesh and blood, so that they may be heavy enough not to be led out into the universe. Since all things having a relationship to both the human and the cosmic require not only an earthly, but also a cosmic arrangement, what you find described in my occult science occurred. At a certain time, as you know, not only was the earth formed, revolving in its orbit around the sun, but it was provided with the moon as its satellite. What does it mean that the earth has a moon as its satellite? It means nothing more than that it acquired a force through which it can attract and hold the moon nearby. Should the earth not possess this power to hold the moon, then the spiritual correlative of this force would not be able to change man to his lower nature because this force, from the spiritual point of view, is the same as that with which the earth attracts the moon. It may be said then that the moon is placed in the universe as an opponent of Lucifer in order to hinder him. I have already alluded to this mystery and pointed out that in the period of materialism of the 19th century, this truth has been exactly reversed in Sinnott's book Esoteric Buddhism. There the moon is described as something actually hostile to man. The truth is that it is not hostile to him, but prevents him from falling victim to the temptation of Lucifer. It acts as the cosmic correlative of what constitutes the attachment of the human being to his lower nature. Rather than tearing the souls out of the lower nature, and thereby preventing its concomitant spiritualization, a subconscious process was required. 
Had the arrangement been conscious, a man would have followed the urges of his lower nature in full consciousness and would have sunk to the animal level. There had to be something in the lower nature of which man was not conscious and which he did not follow except as a human being on earth would follow what flowed into his lower nature as a divine element. Especially the God of the Old Testament, the Java God, was concerned that the human being should remain on earth. Java is connected in this mysterious way of the moon, as you will find explained also in occult science. From this statement you can estimate how materialistic it was to designate the moon as the eighth sphere, whereas it really is the force itself, the sphere, that attracts the moon. In her misguided ways, Bavatsky developed special malice in her secret doctrine by maligning the Java god as a mere moon god. She wanted to replace him with Lucifer, whom she undertook to represent as the friend of the spirit. To be sure, Lucifer is just that, but only in the particular sense I have explained. Blavatsky tried to represent the Jave god as the god of the mere lower nature, whereas what really constituted an opposition to Lucifer was implanted in the lower nature. You see how dangerous it is to set up truths that may be perverted to their opposite. Blavatsky was misled by certain beings who had an interest in guiding her into putting Lucifer in the place of Christ, and this was to be achieved by introducing precisely the opposite of the truth of the eighth sphere, and by maligning the Jave God, representing him merely as the God of the lower nature. Thus did those cosmic powers who desired to advance materialism work even through what was called theosophy. Materialism would obviously have sunk to its worst abyss if men had come to believe that the moon was really the eighth sphere in the sense indicated by Sinnet or Blavatsky, and that Christianity must be fought in every way. Now placing the opponent of Lucifer in the lower nature of man was only possible so long as the human being had not developed his ego in the manner in which this took place at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. The degree to which this ego was subdued in ancient times is greatly underestimated. It was subdued and appeared only during the centuries just prior to the mystery of Golgotha. Then it no longer sufficed merely to place in the subconscious or unconscious nature what strove against Lucifer. Something had to come that the human being could take up into his consciousness. This is the Christ, who follows the Jave God in evolution. It was necessary that the Christ should come so that through an avowal of him, the human being might consciously oppose mere spiritualization, as this was striven for on the part of Lucifer. Christ descended for all human beings, and only through our feeling related to everything else do we belong to the earth. The deeper understanding of the Christ derives from our connection with all human beings, and from our effort to attain a full and complete connection with them. You see, as long as men lived without the fully developed ego before the mystery of Golgotha, they passed through the portal of death into the spiritual world and entered into relationship with archai, archangels and angels. But since they had not yet developed the complete ego here on earth, even after they had passed through the portal of death, they did not need to develop a connection with the higher spiritual beings consciously. This was regulated through the atavistic powers that lay within them. But since the mystery of Golgotha, not by reason of it, but since that time, everything has become quite different. Let us look at ourselves and see how things have changed. A human being passes through the portal of death, as do others, or perhaps one person passes through the portal of death and others remain here on earth. By virtue of his or her passing through the portal of death, an individual continues to be a human being, and if we desire to keep our connection with such an individual, our relation to him or her cannot change. Let us now bear in mind, however, that at the present time, since we live after the mystery of Golgotha, the human being in ascending into the spiritual world passes through the hierarchies of the angels, archangels and archai. Since he is now within the period in which his ego has developed here on earth, he possesses a consciousness also for the other hierarchies that are above them. That is to say, he develops consciously the forces poured into him from beings that are even higher than the archive. 
What does this signify? Let us take a concrete case and assume that through death a person loses one who is dearly beloved. The one who is passed through the portal of death maintains for many years, of course, a connection with certain inclinations and tendencies that he had during his lifetime. However, since he developed his ego here in this lifetime as a human being, something in him begins consciously to work on the perspective of his next incarnation immediately after he has passed through the portal of death. This occurs in a decisive way in what I've called in the mystery plays the midnight of existence. It appears to some extent in human consciousness immediately after death. When a person is in this state, however, there lives in him what already draws him away from what he was born into in his last life. Let us suppose that in his last life he belonged to a certain nation. The person who has remained behind continues to belong to this nation in his physical body, but a force belonging to an entirely different nation takes possession of the one who has died. How can the bond between the two continue beyond death undiminished in strength? Only when the one who remains here has an understanding for what extends above the angels, archangels and archi, that is, above what one may develop here through one's inclination toward relationships to human groups. If someone remains behind as a member of a certain nation, and loses a friend through death who is already preparing to be a member of a different nation, the bond of love with the dead person cannot remain undisturbed. Only through the fact that both confess Christ, that they understand Christ in what extends above all differentiations of men, can this bond be supramundane. What did John the Baptist say when Christ Jesus came to him to be baptised? Behold the Lamb of God who beareth the sins of the world. The full significance of these words might make us grow power were we to take it in its full weight. It might be asked why Christ has been victorious and not Mithras. During the time when Christianity was spreading from the east towards the west, the Mithraic cult expanded along the Danube, along the way to France and Spain in Western Europe. The cult of Christ, however, has been victorious over the Mithraic cult. Why? Because the cult of Mithras had developed from extending above angels, archangels and archai, and through this upward extension wished to attain to the light giver and ruler of the world. What is the Christ in contrast to this? The Christ is he who took upon himself for the evolution of the earth all that is bound up with angels, archangels and archai, that is, all that chains man to the earth. He bears the sins of the world, those sins that have come into the world through human differentiation. He is a being in whose presence we must say, I belong to a single human community because I belong to a single human community, to something connected with the earthly. I separate myself from the divine. From this I can be redeemed only by a being who has nothing to do with human differentiation. The Christ in me leads me beyond earthly differentiations, teaches me to feel that what has been produced by earthly differentiation is suffering, that it brings death. Only through such an understanding of the Christ in me do I find my connection with the spiritual world. All that entered humanity through the fact that differentiations have come about has been removed from it through the entrance of Christ into the world. Christ could not, therefore, be a divinity like Mithras, who guides the human being beyond himself. He is the one God who descended to earth and took away the sins of differentiation and cleansed man of them. Mithras rushes through the world with a sword in his hand that he thrusts into the lower nature to slay it, under him the lower nature dies. Christ offers himself as the Lamb of God who takes the lower nature into himself in order to redeem it. Much lies in this comparison, immeasurably much. It is for this reason that the idea of Christ is not to be separated from the idea of death and resurrection. Only when we realise that what leads men to the earth brings him death that there is more in him than what brings him into the earthly atmosphere, and that something is in him that is the Christ who leads him away again. In Christo Morimo. Only then do we understand the Christ and know that we are united with him.
Thus, the representations of the ancient gods could set triumphant beings before us, but the Christ could only be represented by the joining of human beings in suffering and death, because Christ endured all that enters into the differentiations of man throughout the earth. It is thus that Christ becomes the one who leads man through death and back into the spiritual world, but this also makes him the divinity who may be approached here on earth as we pass beyond Maya or illusion. As the Christ is born here from the womb of Maya, so must we draw near to him by advancing beyond Maya and appealing to him in all the higher reality that projects into Maya, but isn't Maya itself. If it is to turn to this worship of Christ, mankind will still need a long time on earth. Nevertheless, we must begin again to take Christianity earnestly. It is taken least of all seriously by the theologians who are frequently in conflict over whether or not Christ performed miracles and, for example, drove out demons through them. Well, it is entirely superfluous to argue over whether or not Christ drove out demons. It is more important that we learn to reproduce his miracles and thereby cast the demons out now where we can. We still have little power to cast out demons in the higher sense, as antiquity knew how to do it through its atavism, that is the destiny, the karma of our epoch. But we can begin to drive out those demons of whom I spoke yesterday. They are there and it is negative superstition to suppose that they are not. How do we drive them out? Humanity will be convinced that they are being driven out when what is unholy service today becomes holy, that is, permeated with the Christ consciousness. In other words, this means that we must change to a sacramentalism in which man's deeds are imbued by the consciousness that the Christ stands behind him everywhere. Thus, he ought to do nothing in the world except that in which the Christ can help him. If he does something else, the Christ must also help him, but he is thus crucified again and again in human deeds. The crucifixion is not merely a single deed, it is a continuing deed. So long as we do not drive out the demons through what lives in our souls by changing external mechanical actions into holy actions, we will continue to crucify Christ. It is from this point that our education to a true Christianity must begin. What was symbolically practiced in the ancient cults of Christianity and was once performed only at the altar must take hold of the entire world. Humanity must learn to deal with nature as the gods have done. It should learn not to construct machines in an indifferent way, but to fulfill a divine service and bring sacramentalism into everything that is produced. It is already possible to make a beginning in many things, most of all, human beings can begin to develop sacramentalism in two areas. The first is that of educating and teaching children. We will begin to spiritualise what the religions call baptism when we look upon every human being who enters the world through birth as bringing his or her Christ forces with him or herself. Thus we will have the right reverence before the growing human being and can then direct the entire education and especially the teaching of the child in this spirit so that we bring in this teaching of sacramentalism to fruition. We can achieve the same end when we not only look upon educating and teaching the child as a divine service, but also make it such a divine service. Finally, when we endeavour to bring what we call our knowledge into our consciousness in such a way that, as our souls are filled with ideas of the spiritual world, we are aware that the spiritual world is entering into us and that we are being united with the spiritual, when we look upon that as a communion, when we can realise true knowledge in a sentence you find expressed before 1887. Thinking is the true communion of humanity, when the symbolic sacrament of the altar will become the universal sacramental experience of knowledge. It is in this direction that the Christianising of man must move forward. You will then come to the knowledge that everywhere in life reality enters into mire in everything that is related to the Christ, and that to look upon reality after the manner of modern science with its world conception is, in the most eminent sense, unchristian. It is strange how people nowadays are so easily able to adjust to what is unchristian and how little they can find their way to everything in Christianity 
that is appropriate to our time. As yet, we can see very little that counteracts materialism from, as I might say, a darkling inclination. If there are some beginnings, people embracing them proceed on false paths in that they, in a confused way, turn to old relations rather than to spiritual science. Forgive me if I mention this in connection with something that concerns me personally, but I am doing this only to cite an example. I may already have pointed out in these lectures that Hermann Barr, a contemporary personality whom I knew very well in my youth, is again in the process of seeking spiritual things. He is not seeking them in spiritual science because his interest for it is very limited. Take his very fine and intelligent book on Expressionism and you will discover that he has only a marginal interest in spiritual science. But you can also see from the book itself that up to its publication he has informed himself about spiritual science only to the extent of his having read Levi's book on my world view and on the people who oppose it. He has not found the way yet to really engage himself more deeply. However, it is interesting that he wrote a novel whose hero becomes acquainted with everything, contemporary chemical laboratories and so on, attending Oswald's lectures in Leipzig, busying himself a bit with the theosophists in London and so forth. His hero becomes exposed to everything which the present day offers in spiritual sensations, and he even dabbles in spiritism. And then he asks someone, I don't remember who it was, to give him esoteric exercises which he practices for a while. But he is impatient, continues them only for a short time, does not achieve results and then abandons them. In fact, he gives up on all his endeavours after a short while. Then he has some strange experiences. The most interesting thing for me has been that, in a curious way, much in this book is reminiscent of what I have mentioned most recently in lectures, even about actual events, although I haven't seen Herman Barr for the past 28 years except once, but then we definitely did not discuss questions related to our views of the world. Recently, Herman Barr also had a play of his stage which is entitled The Voice. One need not defend this play for the simple reason that Herman Barr just is not trying to find his way into spiritual science, which he finds too difficult, but is relapsing into orthodox or, let's say, more recent Catholicism, at any rate, he is in search of spiritual life. It is interesting how the hero of this play is in search of spiritual life. He is married to a lady, the daughter of a very orthodox mother, and herself very orthodox in view. This lady is deeply serious about Christianity, more so than can be expected of a human being. However, her husband, the hero of the play, is a disciple of Oswald and Hackle, and is quite a materialist. Since his wife and mother-in-law are serious Christians, they are, of course, pained by the fact that the husband is a disciple of Oswald and Haeckel, and does not want to hear anything about the spiritual world. The wife grieves so much about this that she dies. After her death, the husband, from an unknown, dark feeling, frequently thinks his deceased wife is calling out one thing or another to him. One day, in the sleeping compartment of a train, he hears the voice of his wife with special clarity. This almost makes him insane. When the train stops at a station, he rushes out and behaves like a lunatic in what I believe was the waiting room of a station. The train went on without him and later it was demolished in a railroad accident. The injured people are carried into the station and then he realises that he had been saved by the voice of his deceased wife. She had caused him to leave the train in which he would have otherwise perished. This was the first time that he associated the voice of his wife with the conditions of reality. I do not want to condemn this. I simply want to tell you what a contemporary human being commits to paper these days. The hero of the play, by experiencing this apparent miracle and the after-effect of this woman's being beyond her death, realises that he has been saved by her and this causes him to reflect anew about the connection of human beings with the spiritual world. Later, his wife continues to communicate with him frequently, and the ensuing intimate friendship between his soul and the soul of his deceased wife leads him back to Christianity in the truest sense, and he overcomes his materialistic world view. Even though we do not need to defend this play as such, we see that there are human beings nowadays who strive to instil the view into life 
that a truth of the spiritual world can manifest itself in Maya, the great deception. Only a clear understanding of Christianity will build the bridge between the life here on earth and the life that exists in the spiritual world. Quite a few people today have a need for this spiritual world, but we must admit that their number is insignificant in relation to the large number of those people who are even mired in traditional religions and thus have fallen prey to materialism, even if they don't admit it, or whose lives are directly determined by materialism and do, do, who do not have a real connection with the spiritual world. As I said before, we need not defend Var's play, but it can nevertheless direct us to this important realisation. Whoever wants to understand Christianity in its deepest meaning must get beyond the problem of death. After all, the most interesting thing in this play is that it takes as its point of departure the relation between the human soul and the human body which transcends the portal of death. To be sure, there is a basic error in all these things. Instead of being led to Christianity, for which process spiritual science, as we understand it, wants to make a real beginning, we are again led back to an individual religious denomination. If human beings would only understand the Christ in the way I've indicated today, and if we may still continue to speak here, I will deal with this matter more thoroughly. If they could so understand the Christ as the matter has been explained today in only the most elementary suggestions, then the feeling and conceptions that are developed in regard to him could be conveyed to all human beings. Christ did not die only for those who belonged to some Christian sect, but he died and rose again for all mankind. We must not associate some specific religious confession with the being of Christ, but every religious confession is to be brought into connection with Christianity. If all people would come to understand how to conceive the Christ, as has been indicated, Christianity would spread over the entire earth because the revelation of Christ and the revelation of Jesus are two different things. If we go as missionaries to foreign cultures or even to people in our own lands and wish to force upon them the worship of Jesus within a religious denomination, we will not be understood since the knowledge of these people extends far beyond what is brought to them by this or that missionary. I should like to know, for example, what a Turk would say if a modern Protestant pastor should try to convey to him his conception of Christ. This conception, as it is dealt with by modern Protestant pastors, holds that there was once a Socrates, and then one who was somewhat more than Socrates, the Christ, the human being, the special human being, but still the human being, or any of those confused things that are said today in modern Protestantism about Christ. The Turk would say to him, what? You tell me such a thing and you wish to be called a Christian? Just read the 19th chapter of the Quran. Much more is contained in it about the Christ than what you are telling me. In other words, the Turks know a great deal more concerning Christ Jesus than what the modern Protestant pastors are prone to present because the Quran contains more about him and Christ, is re represented much more as the divinity in the Turkish confession than in that of the modern Protestant. This is simply not realised because nowadays people do not often go so far as really to read the original religious documents, rather they utter much superficial nonsense regarding all possible religions. The Jesus revelation too will touch men in the proper way, but they themselves must attain its truth by their own power. They will be able to do this after having passed through a sufficient number of incarnations. Everyone today is to some degree prepared to receive the Christ revelation. This is a, dis is a distinction that must be made. However, many forces are at work to suppress the real Christ revelation and genuine spiritual science. In this regard, you need only to remember some of the things I previously mentioned regarding my characterization of various endeavors which lay claim to being a cult.